Hey, this is Evan Mark Katz, dating coach for smart, strong, successful women, and your personal trainer for love. Welcome back to the Love You Podcast, where I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about dating, relationships, sex, and men from a man's point of view. And uh, I got a story for today. Um, uh, sometimes I come with a whole bunch of prepared stuff, but today it's, it's kind of story time. Um, I just came back from my first Love You graduate retreat. This is something I've wanted to do for a long time, uh, to take graduates from my Love You course to a uh, luxury resort and spend three days uh, mostly having fun, doing a little bit of learning, a little bonding, um, a lot of laughing, eating, drinking. Um, so this retreat uh, planned by my wife, it's her business is event planning, uh, went off perfectly. And uh, these, these women were extraordinary. Seven out of the 10 women who were in attendance uh, had boyfriends uh, a, a year ago when they joined my course, they did not. So it, it was a great source of, of joy and pride and a great reminder that I want to do more uh, live in person. You know, I, I do a lot of talking to crowds and writing to crowds, but I really like people and, and this was a great affirmation of, of, of the power of of in-person coaching and meeting. That's the setting for the story. We're at the Four Seasons in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, bunch of mostly middle-aged white people. And we were sitting out by the pool um, for pit patches every day. We were there Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And sitting right next to the pool were five women with platinum blonde hair in tiny bikinis in their 30s and everybody around the pool was watching these women like you couldn't not watch these women um, especially again if you are like most of the people there not 30 years old long blonde hair bikini model looking person so you can't help but to theorize who are these people right and there's one older guy who's with them so, I mean, everybody's got their sort of snarky jokes. They, oh, he must, you know, he must be a prostitution ring or he must be their John or their sugar daddy or everybody's coming up with stuff and making comments and we, we don't know anything. We just see, see them sort of lounging next to the pool like, like seals, sort of, you know, strutting around in their bikinis or something like that. And I, uh, it was, it was mysterious. I mean, it was, it was one of the things. It was almost like a, a running joke of the trip. Who are these women? And so it's the end of the trip. Uh, it's Sunday. We rented a cabana. Um, a lot of the women are, are leaving. We're sitting in the pool. We're having a couple of drinks. And I said, I'm going to find out who these women are. And one of the great things about being a, a married dating coach is that you're fearless. Like, you know, <laughs> if, I, if I were 30 and single, I would not have the guts to approach these five women. At 44 and married, I, there's, nothing, there's nothing to stop me. I can't get shut down. I can't get hurt. My wife is right there. It's not like I'm hitting on these people, but everybody wanted an answer to this mystery. So I go over and I start. I, I don't even know what I said to break into the conversation, but I was probably honest. I probably said something to the effect of, who are you people? <laughs> um, and what, what, what I ended up learning was astonishing. Just, I mean, it, it, it blew me away. Um, they were they were Polish. They weren't Russian. They weren't models. <laughs> uh, they were uh, Pol Polish uh, expatriates living in Chicago for 15 years. Um, the older man who was with them, um, he was 55, um, and he was there celebrating the birthday of his girlfriend, who was 40, who was one of these women. And this was her 40th birthday party, and he flew in all of her best friends to celebrate her 40th birthday at the Four Seasons. Um, so he wasn't, he, you know, uh, he, was, he, was, he was wealthy, but he, you know, he wasn't like running some sort of escort ring or anything like that. It was just a, a 40th birthday party at the Four Seasons with this, this guy who's a, a prominent uh, uh, gentleman in, in Texas, very successful businessman and sweet and interesting. We learned that the 40-year-old woman that who, who's with this, this guy, uh, he, he and she both took uh, landmark education. Um, if you know anything about landmark education, um, you know, it was est in the 70s. It's, you know, it's, it's like big group therapy, very 
interesting, challenging, confrontational, where you look at yourself very clearly and you own your own flaws and you vow to create a new future. It's, I mean, I've taken the courses, but I'm a self-help guy. So here is this, you know, <laughs> real Texas multimillionaire, this 40-year-old woman who's, uh, who looks like a, a model, and she's a life coach, right? Very smart, very articulate, very self-aware, um, wants to help others, speaks her own special language with her boyfriend. And they have this amazing relationship, this Brady Bunch family. Uh, they each have three kids, and they recently relocated to Scottsdale from Texas. And the, her younger sister was sort of the most no noteworthy person there. She was, she was uh, in her early 30s. Uh, she was wearing a tiny gold sequin bikini and she had long hair down to her ass, like Rapunzel. And I mean, again, you couldn't not look at her. <laughs> and I started talking to her and discovered that she's not cold and she's not a bitch and she's not a model. <laughs> she's an esthetician and she um, is on a break from her on again, off again boyfriend and really, really struggling with it. She has an avoidant attachment style. She. Uh, has trouble making intimate relationships and making decisions, and she vacillates between really nice guys and really bad boys. And her older sister, who was celebrating her birthday, was is you know kind of like the you know re most responsible one, is always telling her what to do. So you saw this sort of love and sibling rivalry. And um, I spent probably about an hour talking to them in the pool, and then I reported back to um, my little clan, my wife and the, the women of the Love You Retreat, and told them what was going on. And sure enough, people from all over the pool started to come to me, because it was like, who was the guy who was brave enough to talk to those women? What was their real story? We were wondering too. I mean, everybody was wondering about these people. And I was delighted to report that everybody in the pool was completely judgmental, was completely wrong, and no, had no sense of the reality of the situation. So. Um, I'm talking to, again, this, this stunning <laughs> uh, young woman in a tiny gold bikini in front of my wife and getting information from her and giving her free dating and relationship coaching um, and uh, letting her know how she was perceived. Right? She was perceived as cold and she was perceived as aloof, but when you got to know her, it was, it was sort of anything but. Um, she's, she has sort of a mask and she wanted to know the reason that nice guys uh, never came up to her is because she's sort of intimidating to nice guys. Uh, the only guys are going to come up to her, you know, fools like me who have nothing, nothing to lose because they got a ring on their finger and have a, are just trying to get answers to questions and probably really confident sleazy guys will hit on anybody. But her veneer of invulnerability and iciness is going to prevent a guy from coming over. Right? And so, you know, Oh, that was one tiny takeaway, but by the end of the conversation, she said, I, I mean, I'm not kidding. She's like, you've changed my life. And then later her sister was like, you've changed my sister's life. And I, I've been trying to say some of these things to her for years and it didn't get through, but it took, you know, an objective third party to help her and, you know, we're never going to forget you. And this whole lovely exchange to the point where, the, again, this is the end of my love you retreat. <laughs> Um, but women are going home, they've got to catch flights, and so, you know, there's only uh, four or five, you know, stragglers who are going to be there at the end of the night. Uh, we invited them out, and they came and they joined us uh, for drinks after dinner on Sunday night. And we probably sat with them for two, two and a half hours just talking about their businesses and their relationships and how they met and their aspirations. and. I was going to keep in touch with the the forty year old life coach and see if I could help her build her her practice, um, which is really really interesting. You know, uh, helping helping immigrants assimilate into America and make powerful life choices and stuff like that. And just juicy, deep, meaningful conversation with good people who, from the surface, couldn't look different. Right? Some you know, big uh, rich Texas Republican and five <laughs> young beautiful blonde women and, uh, again, you know, a bunch of white middle-aged people who were just there, um, you know, trying to, trying to get happy in love. So um, I 
I found the story so powerful because it was the, the personification of what we always do in real life. Right? We judge the book by the cover without actually opening the book. Um, and in the second half of this podcast, I'm going to, that was the story that gets us into it. In the second half of this podcast, we're going to talk about the actual practical application of that, how you are consistently judging books by their cover, how you're being judged by your own cover, and how this is getting in the way of you making real connection and finding lasting love. Uh, this is the Love You Podcast. My name is Evan Mark Katz, and we will be back after the break. Hey, this is Evan Marquette, dating coach for smart, strong, successful women, or your personal trainer for love. Welcome back to the second half of this Love You podcast, a place where we learn everything that you need to know about dating relationships, sex, and men from a man's point of view. And uh, we're continuing the conversation about judging a book by its cover. Um, uh, I was debating whether I should call the this episode "Don't Judge a Book by Its Cover." Um, since I, once, upon, once upon a time, I wrote a blog post by that very name. And the blog post was about a book, which you may or may not have heard of, but it was a New York Times bestseller back in 2010, called Marry Him, uh, The Case for Settling for Mr. Good Enough. It was written by Lori Gottlieb. Um, she's a friend of mine, and I coached her throughout writing the book. And so there's five full chapters about our uh, relationship and her growth. Uh, the publisher was the one who named it that. The author did not want to name it that. Um, but it is controversial, and it does sort of cut to um, most people's biggest issue when it comes to dating and relationships. When is it, you know, when is it time to step away from the table? And so the word settling triggers something in us. Right? I've always used the definition, settling means you're unhappy, compromising means you're happy. Right? You compromise your way into happiness, you settle your way into unhappiness, and no one's asking anybody to settle. So we'll leave that word aside. The question is, what compromises can one make to be in a relationship? And is it even, in fact, a compromise? Um, uh, Lori, the author of that book, uh, wanted to date the male version of herself, right? Upper Ivy League, six-figure income, contributor to NPR, uh, you know, reads about science, um, you know, going for advanced degrees. I mean, Lori is a very, very impressive person. She had trouble accepting the fact that uh, her, her partner might not be the same. Um, so anybody she saw when we were dating online was instant no. All right, this is before swipe right, but it was, oh, he lives in you know the valley, we live in LA. He lives in the valley, he must be some boring accountant guy. I live in the valley. Um, you know, oh, he uh, is five foot seven, he must have a Napoleon complex. Well, she's like five foot one. So, uh, Everything was a reason to discriminate against someone. And this is what I mean by judging a book by its cover. The most famous story in that book was how she judged a guy because he wore a bow tie in one of his online dating photos. When she actually met him, she discovered that the bow tie was uh, an homage to his grandfather who had this massive bow tie collection. It wasn't like this guy thought he was some dandy making a fashion statement. It was literally like the, the sweetest reason you could possibly use for wearing a bow tie in honor of his grandfather. And she ended up dating him and falling for him. The relationship didn't work, but it was just another example of judging a book by its cover. So to play the other side of the fence, it's not that there's no truth to stereotypes. Right? Stereotypes come from somewhere. We don't, we don't just make them up. It, like if the women sitting by the pool did turn out to be Russian bikini models with no personality, I wouldn't have been shocked. <laughs> but the problem was I didn't, you know, most of us didn't take the time to find out. Right? So it's not that there's not truth to stereotypes, it's that people don't always adhere to the stereotype. Right? Stereotypes are not always true. Not every platinum blonde who doesn't have an outward extroverted smile is secretly some sort of cold bitch. Right? And it's, again, it's a mistake that everybody in the entire Four Seasons was making right? by observing these beautiful women by the pool. And so we can sort of go down the list about how you are ruling people out. And my, my audience is primarily women, so I'm talking to you women. I could say the same thing to men, right? just using different words. Not every short guy is the same. Not every separated guy is the same. Not every divorced guy is the same. Not every 40-year-old guy who's never been married is the same. Not every Jewish guy is the same, or church-going guy, or atheist guy. 
not all the same. Not every lawyer is the same. Not every artist is the same. Not every single dad is the same. Um, but because we've been burned by experience, we tell ourselves these stories. Right. Oh, I once dated a Jewish guy and there was a lot of pressure from his family to marry someone else Jewish and then he wanted me to convert so I'm swearing off Jewish guys. A lot of people can tell that story. That doesn't describe me. I, not at all. My mom was really embracing of my, my wife. I didn't ask my wife to convert to anything and you know, we found our, our own unique compromise with religion. But if you've been burned by Jewish guys who had you know, fulfilled that stereotype, you'd say, I'm swearing him off. I, oh, I, you know, I once dated this divorced guy and he was completely so much baggage and hatred towards his ex-wife and serious alimony and child support issues and custody rights. And yeah, that's a really common story with middle-aged divorced people. It's just not every person who's ever been divorced, you know, is, is in, you know, a, a pit of hell and has a, a, you know, a hateful relationship towards their ex. Plenty of them do and you, you do want to be cautious around them, but let's understand, you don't want to swear off any large group of people, right? We're always looking for the exception to the rule. Even if the rule is avoid this, avoid this, avoid this, I've been hurt by this before. And so again, we'll go down, I mean, I, I made a list here, right? The short guy is perceived to have a Napoleon complex. The separated guy is way too complicated. The divorced guy has tons of baggage. The Jewish guy wants you to convert. The churchgoer thinks that you're going to hell. The atheist thinks he's better than you. The lawyer's argumentative and un unavailable. The artist is crazy and poor. The single dad is, is harried and has nothing to give to the relationship. And these are not things that are created from nowhere. They have a basis in truth, but they're never 100% true. My wife is divorced. She comes from a right-wing, conservative, military, Catholic family. Right? The worst thing I could have d done is assume she is just like everybody in her family or of her faith or of her political persuasion. Right? It's just not true. Um, and I'm fortunate that I got to know her instead of trying to judge her from a snapshot online. And that's one of the inherent contradictions of all of this. Online dating is a great way to meet people. Really, a great way to meet people. The problem is we have so much information that we find reasons to rule people out. We're always judging the book by the cover. Right? And then once you factor in dating apps where you don't even have information, you're literally just judging a book by its cover. Right? Is this person cute and doable? Swipe right. That's really no way to make big life decisions, and yet that's what we're sort of, we're sort of uh, reduced to. And to be clear, I'm not... I'm not above it. I mean, I, I might have been, uh, you know, the, the, the guy who broke through and talked to the, the Polish women at the Four Seasons, but, you know, I'm, I'm no different than anybody else in rushing to judgment. I did rush to judgment. If anything, I just, I had this insatiable curiosity and I was dared, hey, go over and talk to them. But I could have easily left the Four Seasons uh, sticking with my original conclusion based on looks. Um, we're all a little bit shallow and we're looking for shortcuts shortcuts to put people in their place and, and make, make conclusions that save us the trouble of digging deeper. I've got no doubt um, that there are people who are uh, uh, listening to me right now or watching me right now who have their preconceived idea of who I am based on my profile, right? Uh, liberal Jewish uh, atheist uh, guy who likes to hear himself talk, has all, all of his theories, talks about his happy marriage. Um, and therefore, he must be uh, some, you know, someone who's uh, insufferable or intolerant or, I don't know, I mean, I've, I've read things about it on the internet, it, it gets worse. But at the end of the day, I don't worry too much about what anybody thinks. People who, people who know me, um, like me and get me and know that, that uh, your perceptions are not always accurate. Uh, they're just a piece of the puzzle. And if you dig deeper, you discover there's a lot more to any person. Um, this, it's particularly inflammatory when it gets to times like this with politics and we assume that anybody who votes this way is a certain way, anybody who votes this way is another way. Um, again, it's more judging the book, right? You just you have the title and you assume everything inside is the same when in fact everybody kind of has their own book. And as I got older and I started coaching, um, and listening to other people make these same mistakes on the phone, it, it held up a mirror to me, right? I was, I was a guy who was like, 
like Chandler on Friends in my 20s. I would reject women for the silliest reasons. I remember, I'm gonna embarrass myself right now. I remember I once didn't go on a second date with someone uh, because I gave her a hug and she had a fat back. That is horrifying. And I did it, I remember. I remember the hug and being like, oh, I can't do this. It was a lovely person. And I, I overreacted to that thing. And I remember at the time, I was like, oh my God, you're terrible. It was my mid twenties or something like that. So years and years of dating and coaching um, and seeing other people's success, it, it occurred to me, the people who got happily married were the ones who made these compromises, who did not judge the book by their cover, right? Virtually nobody I know is with their dream person that they had on a piece of paper, which is usually the opposite sex version of themselves. <laughs> Virtually nobody I know has that. Right? The happiest married people I know, right? the ones who fit like puzzle pieces or a, 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 a shoe in a foot are complementary and different. Uh, and they don't always understand each other's differences or even agree on the differences, but they, they tolerate them, they embrace them. And I talk about religion in our house and, you know, we raise our kids Jewish, we have a Christmas tree in the house, right? Um, that's our way of doing things. You could disagree and say that that's wrong. It's not your place to say, right? So my wife compromised, compromised on religion. I compromised on age. She was three years older than me and I wanted to have two kids. That was pretty scary. My sister found a man who was older than her considerably, you know, like seven, eight years, bald, not her type. Uh, my cousin chose a man who had a less impressive career. All the rest of my friends, mostly Jewish, uh, married non-Jewish women, friends and cousins. I don't think there's a, a Jewish couple within any of them. Two of my closest friends married women in their 40s and then had kids uh, through IVF. Um, and so this is what gets reinforced over and over and over again. And, and got, I got smacked over the head with it at the Four Seasons. Right. The entire pool is sitting around passing judgment on these women, not knowing that they're celebrating a 40th birthday party. They flew in for their friend. They have deep loves, deep love. Like when they were saying goodbye, they were hugging and crying. It was beautiful people on the outside and on the inside that you could easily dismiss because they dressed up in shiny outfits and had great bodies. And it's, it's just... I don't know how many times I need to have that smacked upside my head for me to not instantly go to a stereotype. We, from the outside, were internally mocking them. We were looking down on them because that's comfortable for us. It's, all, it's always comfortable to find someone to look down on. Republicans look down on, li on liberals and liberals look down on Republicans and so on and so forth. We always need someone to look down on, but it's not the whole story. It's insecurity. It's not being able to see deeper and being afraid of having your preconceived notions challenged. So I'm encouraging you to develop a greater sense of humility, not judge a book by its cover the same way that I'm constantly learning to do the same. And uh, maybe you will find a new set of friends like I did. And maybe you'll find a guy who puts aside his preconceived notions in order to be with you. I want to thank you for joining me on this Love You podcast. My name is Edmund Mark Katz. Next week, I'm talking about one of my favorite topics, hookup culture, uh, and what you need to know to survive it. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go follow me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter, at Evan Mark Katz. Uh, and most importantly, go to the text beneath this video, click on one of the links, give me your name and email address, and I will send you free dating and relationship advice until you don't need any more dating and relationship advice. That is my promise to you. Thanks for your time and attention. I will see you again next week. Okay.